Being with your changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by Rollbar. Rollbar is real-time error monitoring, alerting, and analytics that helps you resolve production errors in minutes. And I talk with Paul Bigger, the founder of Circle CI, a trusted customer of Rollbar, and Paul says they don't deploy a service without installing Rollbar first. It's that crucial to them. We operate at serious scale, and literally the first thing we do when we create a new service is is we install Rollbar in it. Like we, we need to have that visibility, uh, and without that visibility, it would be impossible to run at the scale we do, and certainly with the number of people that we have. Like we're a relatively small team operating a major service, and without the visibility that Rollbar gives us into our exceptions, it just it just wouldn't be possible. All right, if you want to follow in Paul's footsteps and start deploying with confidence today, head to rollbar.com slash changelog. Once again, rollbar.com slash changelog. Welcome to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the show at changelaw.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at JS Party FM. And now on to the show. Welcome back, everybody, to JS Party, where we like to throw a party every week about JavaScript and the web. And the one of the things that we like to do at JS Party is have a lot of variety, just like you'd have a, a pizza, perhaps, with a lot of different toppings. Uh, maybe you listened to last week's episode all about burnout. I was just listening to that this morning for us on my morning walk and a great episode from you, Suze and Emma. Of course, we have some interesting things in the works. We're talking about doing some debate style shows, so pay attention for that and subscribe if you haven't yet. We also have a little bit something different today. A show about pizza. Well, maybe not exactly about pizza, but somewhat about pizza. We're joined by a special guest, Anthony Kapinski. But first, let me introduce my panel. Faros is here. What's up, Faros? What's up, Jared? Oh, not too much. Just uh, getting you to install Zoom on your machine, just like my plans are. <laughs> so angry about this. Today of all days. <laughs> I know. I feel like this is a really bad time to announce our cut over to Zoom. <laughs> but, uh, well, we got you here anyways. And Michael Rogers. What's up, Michael? Hey, it's a party with JavaScript. That's right. You got to get that in there. So as I mentioned, uh, we have Anthony Kapinski joining us, uh, a 16-year-old, notably, uh, from Poland. Anthony, introduce yourself and say hi to everybody. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Antoni. I'm 16 years old, as uh, Gerard said, developer from Poland. In my free time, I like creating open source stuff, uh, mainly in JavaScript, but I'm also learning uh, Rust in my free time so that I can use uh, WebAssembly in the future. That is awesome. Let's play a quick game called How Young Did You Start Programming? Michael, pitch it to you because I think uh, 16 is young. Y'all might have me beat. How did everybody get into it? What age? I was like 12 or 13. Okay. Well, I have a question. Does HTML count as programming? Oh, because yes. I, I learned HTML <laughs> first and did that for, for several years, and I did Dreamweaver. So I don't know if that counts, but if, if it does, then yeah, let's does count that it. count? Okay, then. I count the time that I used Dreamweaver in the, the whole arc of my programming. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so we'll, we'll count that time as well. Yes, Dreamweaver counts. Okay, then it was probably like 12 or, 12 or 13 as well. Yeah. Okay. Me too. You see, Anthony, 12 or 13. What, what introduced you to programming, Anthony? Was it the, the internet? Was it. A parent, school, where did you learn about it? Actually, I started programming in C Sharp, but uh, this wasn't really my thing. And uh, I stumbled upon a GitHub profile from a user called uh, Sindra uh, Sorhas. Mm. And when I saw first saw JavaScript uh, code, uh, code, I knew it was something I, I want to learn uh, in the future. And uh, that's how it went off. So I guess I skipped myself. I'm going to lose or win, I, depending on which way you're looking at it, because I didn't I didn't own a computer until I was 18. And I didn't start to program said computer, unless you count downloading stuff off of Napster, which I don't think counts, uh, until probably like 20, 21 age range, college. So... Y'all are killing me. We had a computer run pretty early, not because we had money, but because uh, my dad was a longshoreman. And uh, when computers would get old, they would make their way into the longshoremen's houses. Uh, so <laughs> hmm. instead, 
that works. I was just sort of like, <laughs> that's just like how the docs work. <laughs> I did have a pre-programming moment in high school where one of my friends was taking web programming, something core, like elective in high school. And I don't know if you guys remember the video game Secret of Mana, but I was quite into Secret of Mana. And so was he. And he had a GeoCities page that he made during that class. And I remember the moment where he showed me, he, it, was, it was the avatar or the, the sprite of the main character from Secret of Mana was all that was on the page. Like he managed to like basically add an image tag, you know, uh, or whatever he was, however he was doing it back then. And then he showed me when you roll over it, it changed from like a, he turned into stone or something like that. And he just showed me that little, like, put the mouse on it. And I was, whoa. And I thought that was pretty cool. But it didn't actually get me to go try it myself. I just kind of moved on until later on. But I remember that pretty distinctly as being impressive that you could do that. I remember when I was 17, uh, like, (laughs) I worked with this, like, awful local, uh, like, web uh, consultancy. And um, one of my coworkers uh, wired up this thing where it, in JavaScript, you, you could sort of like make the mouse look like it was sort of like a, it basically like, you know, it, it looked almost like it was slow kind of going across the thing, mm. like would, would leave like an impression of itself that was kind of slowly fade away. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And uh, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, they thought it was so cool that they like put it on their main website for this web consultancy. It's a, it's a completely useless feature. <laughs> like you would never want to put it in an application. <laughs> it was like front and center. Well, that was probably back in the day when everybody was doing the flash intros on their web page. Like, like a website's per point was to be a useless feature. It was like, check out, watch this thing that I made in flash. Well, that maybe that was even before you. Go ahead, Frost. Oh, I'm just curious how Anthony got into programming when he was 12 or 13 and like eventually how he found Cindra Source's page and what he liked about Cindra. Well, let's start with uh, that uh... My first days of programming was uh, more uh, experimenting than than learning, uh, but um, I don't really remember uh, how I uh, found the uh, Cindra uh, profile. But I know that one of his uh, CLI apps, I don't know which one, but uh, looked really cool. And uh, that's how I first wanted to see how the code looks like. So was that when you were 16 or or when you were younger than that? I was 14, I guess. Oh, okay. 14 or 13. So the big difference between you and us is that we're looking way back at that time that we began, and you're looking <laughs> back just a couple of years. And one of the things that's, that's amazing and really caught my eye, I should say the reason why I came across Anthony is because you submitted PizzaQL to Changelog News as something that might be interesting. And I was looking at it and I thought, wow, this is pretty impressive thing to be put together at, at such a young age. Um, and really it was just the list of technologies at play. I mean, going from a few years back, finding a GitHub page to you know building a, a web application with React and GraphQL and MongoDB and all these things. There's just a lot of moving parts that you're pulling together. Uh, and it was it was quite impressive. So, have you been like for the last couple of years just all in on learning this stuff, or is it coming naturally to you? Actually, uh, Pizza QL uh, started as a React learning project, to be honest with you. And from my uh, point, it was the the best learning experience I've ever had because uh, it was just at first it was experimenting, then uh, optimizing, and all of that uh, made me want to learn uh, React. What was your process like from the point that you found open source and GitHub and you're doing some C sharp to the point that you're like you, you have Pizza QL, which is your learning project? It's an experimental learning project and, and an impressive one at that. Did you, did you look for tutorials? Did you take classes? Did you, what are the, some things that you did just getting started and where do you know, you know where to look? Mm-hmm. I started learning the basics of JavaScript, uh, logging what, for example, console log does. Uh, and uh, after I cr- started creating some small websites in vanilla JavaScript, I created uh, some CLI apps uh, like uh, Cache CLI, uh, which has over 100 stars on GitHub. And, but after, after this time, I really wanted to learn React as it was getting popular. And uh, some of my friends uh, who are are also programming uh, were talking about it. And, uh, you know, I tried uh, making something using the default uh, Create React app 
a boilerplate. When I didn't understand something, I just looked in the React documentation, and if I haven't found anything, then I moved to Google and uh, stuff over. Mm. Yeah, and uh, I also attended some talks, uh, for example, uh, in the Allegro. Uh, this is a big Polish company making something like eBay or Amazon, but in Poland. And they have uh, monthly talks about React, uh, front-end technologies and something like that. Also, uh, listening to JS Conf talks from like uh, Dan Abramov uh, was uh, really, really nice and helpful. So are, you said that you have friends who program too. Are those friends who are in high school with you? Or I assume you're, I assume you're in high school still. Are those friends like your age that you're learning, you're, you're all learning to program together and you're sharing things with each other? Or like, yeah, how are you interacting with your friends and what do they think about programming? Actually, in my class, nothing uh, expect, except for me uh, learns programming, which is pretty sad. And uh, these friends are from different, different schools. Some of them I know in real life. They are a bit older than me like one or two years older. And, but we are, as, as you said, we are learning together, uh, sharing projects with each other and just giving suggestions. What do your parents think of, of the stuff you're building? I don't know. I don't know. Really. They say they are pretty impressed, but uh, you know, that's just parents. Actually, none, none of uh, my parents uh, program, so yeah. Well, it's pretty cool that you can reach out to a, a a larger world and community of people around the world like ourselves who are interested in such things. And even if there aren't too many there with you that are into the software and the web like you are, that uh, you can have conversations with people around the world. Uh, curious what Michael and Faraz, we're here talking to somebody who basically he's being self-taught. He's, he's learning on the go. He's still learning. Obviously, we're all still learning. But uh, Anthony had a lot of success kind of just going to the React doc. I mean, I'm kind of impressed that he can just read React docs and just kind of go from there. Of course, you end up Googling around as you get stuck. But um, if you guys had to give advice on getting started today, for us, you're very education oriented. Like what, what resources or processes or tools would you say, here's a good place to start for young people? Uh, maybe, you know, Anthony's age or even a little bit younger. Sure, sure. I, I don't have like a, a strong opinion about like the, the, the first kind of docs that you land on. Um, I mean, it really depends on which projects that you're interested in and which languages you're interested in. And all of them have like varying degrees of, of good or bad docs or books or whatever it may be. Very impressed uh, with, with Rust on this, actually. They've, they've done a pretty good job of, like, they have a lot of beginner docs, including a great book. Once you're programming and you're kind of trying to get better, um, I'd recommend, like, as early as possible doing open source stuff. Um, even if you're not sort of publishing your own work, just, you know, trying to contribute to other things, whether it's just doc fixes or, or tests or whatever, because that code review process, like, gives you an opportunity to interact with other developers and them to kind of level you up. And, and yeah, I mean, if you, if you think about it, the open source ecosystem is just like a giant uh, educational like ecosystem where everybody is yeah. sort of leveling up all of the time and learning from each other. So um, the sooner that you can get involved in that, the, the earlier. Um, that wasn't really accessible to me when I started programming, um, and so I gravitated towards the hacking community, actually, because there was a community that was much more accessible there. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, it, it, there's two ways I could interpret the question. So it's, it, I think one question is sort of like, so when you're learning something, I think one of the biggest challenges is to stay motivated through the process of learning. And so one way to interpret this question is like, what's the best way to sort of keep yourself motivated and, you know, and keep things fun so that you continue to want to keep learning more and more about programming? And then I guess the second way to interpret it would be like, given that you want to learn programming, you know, what are the best resources to use yeah. and what are the best techniques to use? I think that the first part is probably is more interesting to me. Just I think the reason why is, is I think that if you have the motivation, then you sort of will do whatever it takes and you'll, you'll put up with whatever you have to put up with. You know, you'll, you know, you'll read terrible docs. You'll just keep trying something until you figure it out. And so the motivation is really interesting. So at least for me, the way that I got into programming was I wanted to build a specific thing. I was uh, spending a lot of time with, uh, I, had, I had a down period in high school where basically we didn't really do much. Uh, we, were, uh, we were supposed to go around fixing teachers' computers uh, it was called the tech team, but uh, occasionally we just had nothing to do. So we'd sit around watching uh, flash animations and playing flash games uh, on, on those sort of, I don't know if you remember E-Bombs World and uh, oh, yeah. Newgrounds. There were all these old sort of flash flash uh, game websites. We, we were obsessed with these 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 flash games. And so I, I had this natural desire. I was like, I want to collect my favorite flash games and animations and put them onto a website. 
And for whatever reason, that was really motivating to me as like a 13, 14 year old. It just seemed like the coolest thing to have your own website where you could put your favorite games and your favorite, you know, animations. And I was literally just taking them from other websites, downloading the flash files and putting them onto like my own site, which is, <laughs> you know, not, not a very uh, legal or whatever, you know, legit thing to do. But that was, that was how I learned. And so, but that, that kept me motivated and I sort of learned whatever I had to learn in order to, in, in order to, um, to make that work. So yeah, I don't know. I think, uh, I think that was what worked for me. Mm. I'm actually curious. I'm actually curious if that has any connection to what Anthony did. Like what was attractive about programming to you? Is it like, did did you have a specific project you wanted to build or did you just think, you know, programming is this thing that I, this skill that I want to have because yeah, I'm just curious. Like what was the reason you got into it? If we talk about uh, programming in general, for me, it was just a skill uh, I wanted to have. But if we talk about pizza QL, I saw an, pizza uh, ordering system written in uh, PHP and uh, it's Polish uh, it's from a Polish company they sell it for a, a pretty pretty huge amount of money and uh, I, I would like to build something like this but in react and uh, make it open source so that so that uh, others can see it and uh, for maybe in the future uh, use it yeah I think that's really neat. I want to piggyback on what Faraz was saying about motivation. I do believe that that is probably the more important part, of course, we can talk tactically how you get started with these things. I think one place to point young people to, maybe not even young, but uh, new people to is Free Code Camp if they just want to like actually just dive head deep into things, uh, a great source for learning. The thing about motivation, though, is that it's perishable. In fact, it's one of the most perishable goods there are. I'm motivated today, but maybe not tomorrow. And maybe not even this afternoon. Heck, I might be losing my motivation right here as we talk. So, you know, <laughs> staying motivated is a problem. And I think having something that you're really interested in helps you get over those humps. Like, you really want to see this thing exist. And, and I tell a lot of people, if, you, if you're trying to get started, you need to have a real-world project that you're trying to build. And hopefully it's one that you actually care about and want to see exist in the world. And so it sounds like, Anthony, you've hit, at least for now, a really good place where with pizza QL, this is something that you want to exist. And a lot of people say, well, I don't really know. I don't have a project. I don't have any big ideas. You know, how do I come up with something that's, that's worth building or worth using to learn to build? And I actually like the way that you did it is like, well, just look out there for proprietary software that exists or something yes. else that's in the world and people have val- you know, are, are, are using it or is providing value. And then just try to recreate that in, with your own skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I did with Pizza, Pizza QL. This episode is brought to you by Keen. Keen makes customer facing metrics simple. It's a platform that gives you powerful in product analytics fast with minimal development time. For example, a DIY solution to build out customer facing metrics in your product could take six months or more. And with Keen, you can be up and running in the same day. The Keen platform lets you stream events to easily collect and enrich your data, compute with embeddable answers, insights, and metrics, access controls so you can design role based access to your data, and of course, a visualization layer to create stunning charts. And we have a special offer just for our JS Party listeners. Go to keen.io slash JS Party and get your first 30 days of Keen for free. And as a bonus for checking out a 15 minute demo of Keen's customer facing metrics, they'll send you a free Keen t-shirt. Go to keen.io slash JS Party. Again, keen.io slash JS Party. back talking pizza pizza ql anthony you mentioned you saw a polish proprietary website that did this you wanted to build it was in php and you wanted to build one with react and these technologies why pizza though do you love pizza does your parents run a pizza company or you want to open up a pizzeria i no no <laughs> <laughs> i was just uh, order ordering pizza one day and uh, and thought about it okay Oh, is this a user-facing thing? Like, does the user interact with the ordering system, or is it more for the pizza restaurant to manage their orders? Uh, 
Pizza QA is uh, both, uh, both uh, order placement for users and uh, order management for uh, pizza restaurant owners. And I'm, I'm trying to balance the development of um, both uh, panels for, for user and for uh, the owners so that uh, it's uh, all in one product. A lot of times building user-facing software, I mean, it sounds like you have multiple users even. You have the, the customers and you have the management team. The technology and the programming is an aspect, but a lot of the really hard things is like the flow of data and how things are organized and how the system works at a high level. Are these things that come naturally to you or are you still trying to figure them out if we asked you to describe how PizzaQL works from a workflow, like from the end user's perspective, how the data flows through the system? Are these things you've got figured out or are you still learning as you go? Uh, yeah, mo- most of the, the stuff is uh, figured out. I still haven't implemented one of the most important uh, things, which is uh, pricing and ordering. Uh, now you can just uh, order pizza and you don't know uh, how much you need to pay. And that is really important. So I need to implement that. Okay, so uh, how, how Pizza QL works, user places an order, uh, which gets uh, status uh, in progress. And manager sees it on his admin dashboard uh, and they can uh, change its status from completed, cancelled or delete the, the order. So that's pretty basic, basic stuff. Also, there is currently no option for the manager to add uh, orders manually. So, for example, when someone uh, doesn't use uh, online order placement form uh, and instead they uh, call the pizza pizza shop that's uh, something that i also need to implement yeah pizza QL, uh, isn't really that uh, that that ready yet but uh, it's i would say basic uh, it's basic <laughs> yeah a lot to imp- implement so uh, i see that you have one other contributor on github uh, they have two commits it seems so um, how did that happen? Was it a pull request that they sent to you or is it somebody that you know? Wait a second. I will just just look who, who, who oh. it is. <laughs> ah, okay, I, I know, I know. Surprise contributor. So uh, the logo of Pizza QL was actually made by someone else. Nice. Uh, who submitted a, an issue if, they, if I want a, a logo for, for this app and they made it for free. Nice. That's really awesome. Nice way of uh, contributing to open source projects. Yeah. So are you looking for other open source contributors? Yes, of course. Uh, I don't think a a lot of people have much more knowledge than I do. And uh, I think they can uh, improve the the code of uh, PizzaQL and uh, help me add new functionalities to to this project. Okay. I'll start by sending you a pull request and I'll remove all the semicolons from your project. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Yes. Oh, sorry, I, I'm not using uh, your uh, <laughs> leader. Yeah, uh, I, I, I noticed that. Yeah, you're using uh, Cindersaurus's because I, I think you, yeah. I think you like him better. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That is what it's about. Like it's, it's, it's just like you follow your favorite developer and you're like, I want their style guide. That is how it goes. No, but seriously though, that's 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 cool. So um, yeah, so I, I'm curious if after the show that you'll maybe maybe some people who are you know who are curious about the project will come and you know check it out and see if there's any way they can help yeah that would be great when it comes to running the system is it built to be like an open source project that powers a single website that pizza people can sign up for and run their own instance or is it kind of like it's supposed to be a deploy to heroku or glitch or now or whatever kind of a run your own instance or is it really just like, well, you're building a thing and you're building open source and you'll see what happens? From the beginning, it, it was going to be a uh, post-it-yourself project. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I know the, to, do, to do so, uh, I need to write uh, documentation so that uh, others know what to do. And uh, yeah, that's the, the other things, not only building the app, and all, but also writing the docs for both deployment and uh, security and stuff like that. I'm in progress currently of writing the the docs. <laughs> the docs are always in progress. Yes. <laughs> so I'm I'm way more interested in this other project that you did called OG. 
this text emoticon maker, it's pretty rad. <laughs> <laughs> it's like really simple, but also amazing. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it it got a lot of lot of stars. I I don't really know uh, why to to this date. Uh, I really need to update it. <laughs> I, Michael, paste a link to that so I can check it out here. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, it walks you through the the different parts of making like a, a text based emoticon and uh, and then outputs it at the end. And it's it's very simple, but also like I've never been able to make these fancy emoticons before because <laughs> because I I don't get it. Uh, but now I now I actually get it. I understand it's now. <laughs> it makes sense. Oh wow, that's really cool. I just yeah, saw it. Yeah. yeah. This is cool. Okay. OG, OJI. I thought you were doing like the original gangster, like OG. OG. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I know that uh, someone, when I was uh, building that, submitted a pull request uh, that I need to change uh, emoji to emoticon because the the thing that this so this uh, app is creating is not emoji, it's emoticon. And I really need to change that. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. It isn't like a yeah. Emojis are like their own whole sort of spectrum. So emoticons is when you like, it's like the semicolon, right paren yeah. kind of thing, right? Whereas emoji are the actual Unicode characters mm-hmm, yes it's the shit we used to do back in the day on irc it's oh, not yeah. this not this like fancy you know <laughs> like like japanese derived like That's expressive right. images no 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 they're like og emoji yeah exactly exactly i think the the name is uh is proper in, in that regard <laughs> so it's pretty cool that you move from a i'm just now looking at this and thinking this is like a very small scope very cool you know release it into the world and, and move on and pizza ql is more like a you're taking on a very you know kind of serious business large scale large scope project are you trying to advance your skills or is it just kind of what you feel like working on at the time uh, at some point i i thought that uh, making uh, small small projects like uh, og or or something like that uh, is it isn't uh, really enough, and I just uh, I just need to create something else, something bigger, so that uh, I have a perspective on how to work on bigger projects and uh, use that skills in the future. So, what does success look like for Pizza QL? Like, what wh- if you could look back and say that did everything I wanted it to do in my life? What would that be? Like, you got a job, or you learned some stuff, or you built a pizza empire? What would success look like? I would really like to see uh, Pizza QL being used in production. <laughs> of course, there's a, a lot, uh, a lot to do, uh, but I think that might be possible, and I, that would be a, a huge success if uh, if uh, some uh, pizza pizza shops w- would use uh, Pizza QL uh, in in real life to or manage manage uh, orders and stuff. So, have you tried reaching out to any of the pizza shops near you and seeing if they want to give it a shot? Uh, not yet, because I still uh, didn't implement the the really important important features. But I know one uh, one pizza pizza shop nearby, uh, who which uh, does not uh, have a good uh, online uh, online form for ordering. So I think that they will be my my target <laughs> for this project. You know, I have I, I have some customers for you as well. There's uh, Domino's Pizza here in the U.S. has the most complicated ordering form I've ever seen. It's like, it takes 10 minutes to get through it and it feels like you're filling out your taxes just to order all the, all the toppings that you want. It's extremely painful. Um, so if you, want to, if you want me to put you in touch, I can uh, go uh, try, to, try to make a contact there. No, but seriously, I think that when it comes to like talking to potential users, you can never talk to them too early. So maybe if you can talk to that local shop, even before you finished all the features that you want to include, it could help you prioritize the features. You know, if you talk to them and then they, you learn that they actually want this feature, which is different than what you thought they would want, that could really save you a lot of time. If you know, if, if this is if this is a route that you want to go down. Oh, okay, uh, good point. Uh, also, I uh, shared the Pizza QL project on Reddit. Uh, some subreddits like programming, React, uh, uh, web development, and I've also received a lot of suggestions uh, there. Uh, one of the the users write a huge list, like uh, 100 items of what should I do oh, wow. <laughs> to make it easier for people. And uh, I'm really glad I, of that f- feedback. Yeah, I, I, I was m- mainly speaking from personal experience. I think, you know, as a developer, it's, it's really easy to um, get excited about all the features you can build. 
Uh, and I mean, I guess if you're just trying to learn, there's nothing wrong with, you know, just, just building features because it's fun. But if you talk to people who are actually using the software, it can really help prioritize the features and help you figure out what's important. So uh, I made a mistake of, you know, of um, I've, I, in the past, I've actually made this mistake many times of just working on stuff for a really long period of time without really talking to anybody about whether it's a good idea or not. And then, you know, after many months, I, I show it to somebody and I find out, oh, gosh, I built the wrong thing or, oh, you know, they didn't actually want this. So uh, yeah, I'm just uh, trying to save trying to save you that suffering. Yeah, I will definitely need to do that. Thanks. Um, on a somewhat related topic, because you brought up the Domino's Pizza stuff, um, there's this amazing episode of the Reply All podcast, uh, number 141, about these phantom two dollar cokes that happen oh, in, in Domino's, yeah. like across America, and it's like this amazing investigative piece into the, these like like all these stores across America just get um, phantom orders of two dollar cokes for Adam Pisces that never get picked up. And um, I it's, listened it's, to that but, one. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. But it, it also like gets into a lot of details on the technical aspects of Domino's software, including the fact that they have an internal social network for all the employees at all the Domino's across the country. Um, it's it's a it's a fascinating listen, um, and yeah, it, it gives you some insight into how their ordering system works. Like one thing that I didn't r- recognize is that like a big part of their business is people ordering ahead and then picking up in cash. So they like do take orders without like a credit card <laughs> to put them down, and and mm. could potentially like have to throw them away. But it's just like it's such a marginal number of people that don't pick it up; they don't really care. Yeah, I listened to that. I forgot all about it, but now it's all coming back to me. That was a great episode, and the like the actual mystery revelation. I guess we probably shouldn't say what it is, otherwise it kind of ruins the. Yeah, don't don't spoil it. <laughs> Let's just say it's like very appropriate and like yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So you should, Anthony, <laughs> listen to that, listeners, listen to that. If you haven't yet, it's a great episode. Uh, also, uh, in terms of Pizza Q, uh, I I haven't implemented the payment system, and the reason behind it is because here uh, in the US, the I think Stripe has a really good API to, so that you can implement checkout uh, in your in your apps. Unfortunately, Stripe is not uh, not yet supported in Poland. Uh, it is in private uh, beta. I can't get uh, into, unfortunately. <laughs> And other companies in, in, in Poland uh, don't have uh, a good APIs to NPM packages or something like that. And that's really disappointing. Maybe we can get you into that beta. Um, Alex Sexton works at um, Stripe, and he's like an, an old uh, co-host for mm-hmm. this podcast. So he might be oh. able to get you in. Well, we should poke him about it. That would be pretty nice. <laughs> yeah. You know, even if you're not taking orders immediately, just to be able to... Uh, to get a test token so you can actually sort of build out all yes. the infrastructure. And even if, you know, yeah, if, if it, it, might, it might come out of beta by the time you're finished implementing everything. Exactly. This episode is brought to you by Linode, our cloud server of choice. It is so easy to get started with Linode. Servers start at just five bucks a month. We host changelog on Linode cloud servers and we love it. We get great 24 seven support. Zeus like powers with native SSDs, a super fast 40 gigabit per second network and incredibly fast CPUs for processing. And we trust Linode because they keep it fast. They keep it simple. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. The Pizza Quill project, uh, I, I written it in React, but at first I, I wanted to, uh, to build it using uh, Vanilla JS. I guess that's nice if you build something in this way because uh, your app is optimized, uh, of course, if you, if you write it properly, and it isn't bloated in any way. However, I really wanted to learn how to use React and also uh, Next.js which does uh, server-side rendering and all sort of stuff. I also wanted to, to use GraphQL. Uh, this was the second time uh, I was using it. And I found about Prisma, which is an ORM uh, that uh, helps you integrate your GraphQL API with uh, a database. And uh, yeah, I really like this, uh, this project. It, it's, it was really helpful. So since you call it PizzaQL, 
I assume that's you're playing on GraphQL. Is that a, a yes, yes, exactly. Is that a big aspect of, of of the back end? I mean, obviously, if it's your your API layer, it's going to be a, a big aspect. This is a front end and a back end, so si- single page app, I guess, is what the the kids call it these days. You also have Apollo client. You have other things going on. What's the the biggest decision you had to make so far? Is it the GraphQL layer that you decided to go with or React? I assume. I think the main part of this app on the backend is actually GraphQL, or maybe not. Uh, it's Prisma <laughs> because uh, with Prisma you can easily integrate to, uh, as I said before, GraphQL and and the database. And uh, following the tutorials on their their docs page is was also really nice. And uh, implementing the the whole uh, GraphQL thing was really really easy, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> It's easy to expand and uh, all sorts of stuff. I'm curious, did you ever use anything um, besides GraphQL for interfacing with the database? Like, have you made uh, made a RESTful API or anything like that before? Or did you just start with GraphQL? I started with GraphQL, so that's pretty nice, I guess. Uh, But uh, I also, I know that uh, I need to to learn how to use uh, REST. And uh, I was doing it in my private projects just to learn the, get the perspective, uh, how does uh, REST compare to GraphQL. That's so fascinating that that you started with with, uh, with GraphQL. It's, uh, I wonder how that will change sort of how you, what you think of uh, REST when you finally learn it. I, I sort of wonder if the difference is actually between GraphQL and REST and, and GraphQL and like managing database access without like that weird intermediary layer, right? Like, um, which actually cleans up a lot of the rough edges of databases. Like databases are not traditional databases are not fun to work with. Like SQL is like a, a crazy black art that nobody really understands. <laughs> um, and a lot of like the the REST interfaces just sit between you and this other database connection, right? And that those yeah those databases have never been great to use. Like we we tried to do a lot of new stuff in in the kind of NoSQL hype cycle that happened, but. You know, when we netted out the other end, um, everybody still wanted joins. And so <laughs> everything kind of reverted back to the mean. And now we're back to GraphQL, which is like in a way like a much saner approach to to the problem than like ORMs were, right? Like ORMs were, were like the like 2000s version of this where it's like, oh, okay, well, we, we hate dealing with SQL. We'll just put this object map on top of it and <laughs> we'll map all of the fields properly. And that ended up being like highly problematic in terms of scale. And then just not using a lot of database features properly. GraphQL is like a, is a much saner approach to that, where it's like, no, like let, let's take some of the constraints and also some of the benefits of a relational database and expose them to this this layer in this API that actually can map onto object structures a lot easier. Yeah, what, what I like about Prisma is that uh, you you don't really interact with a database. The Prisma does it for you, and uh, I think that making Pizza QL much easier and uh, less time consuming. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, yeah, it's like we've been saying this for years, right? Like CouchDB, like the big thing about CouchDB like 10 years ago was like, it's just an HTTP endpoint that you can just talk to. So you don't have to have like a separate database layer instead of this extra tier. And um, when GraphQL came out, I was like, the, the logical extension here is that there, you just don't talk to a database anymore. There's just a service up that's providing you data storage that has like a GraphQL interface. And so stuff like Prisma just seems like the, the natural extension of, of that whole space. Yeah, what's also nice is that uh, Prisma uh, works with REST, uh, as I uh, found out. So I, I really need to experiment with, with that in the future. In terms of writing your actual business logic with regards to, let's just take one example, like constraints, data constraints. You know, users have to have an email address. In your stack, where are you writing that specific code? Is that like a Prisma class? Like is it a an object that is like a Prisma deal, or help me understand. For uh, all the or the orders are stored in Mongo, MongoDB database, and all of this stuff is managed by Prisma. But authentication, and for now only the managers need to authenticate to access the dashboard uh, to manage orders. Uh, I'm using uh, Out uh, Zero there because I don't really have experience with implementing uh, authentication on the server. And uh, I think that uh, using the uh, ready solution here is good for for security and uh, also it's uh, easy to integrate. So then focus, let's not focus on the users then, let's focus on the orders. 
when you describe in your program what an order is, like what attributes it has, how it works, et cetera, et cetera, are you writing into like the Prisma layer? Are you like using Prisma libraries to define these things? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, as said before, um, the or order when it's created receives a, a status uh, mm -hmm. in progress, right. and uh, this because this is an an object, it also receives uh, other things like uh, name, order address, pizza type, size of the pizza, and other things. And this is what goes to to the MongoDB data database, mm -hmm. and. Uh, all of this stuff uh, is, being, is seen by the manager or a cook that can see and know what uh, which pizza to, to to make. Gotcha. This is really cool. So for the, the component layer, for the visual layer, are you using components that integrate really easily into the, the Prisma objects? Or are you sort of doing that work? Yeah, um, to integrate with uh, the GraphQL uh, Prisma stuff, I'm using Apollo uh, and Apollo React. And uh, I'm taking the advantage of using uh, server-side rendering with uh, with Next.js. And it's it's really easy to, to configure that. Of course, uh, one of the most important features I want to add is to use GraphQL uh, subscriptions so that when someone creates an order, the manager does not need to refresh the page and uh, yeah uh, but to do so i i need to to write a custom prisma resolver which is a thing that that i don't really know what, how to do and uh, i will i need to read uh, more documentation about it I see you're also using styled components here. A really cool library. I hadn't seen this before. Yes, uh, I I don't really like the the way you style uh, React. Uh, and in Next.js, the styled uh, JSX is integrated. But uh, for me, styled components is more clear approach to styling stuff. And uh, it's more like pure uh, CSS. You can write it. Uh, it's it's more it's much easier for me. Yeah, this looks like a great library. I hadn't seen it before, but um, it's a I, I've I've done a few experiments myself with just um, creating web components and using um, template literals to do you know interesting stuff to to instantiate them and create them. And this is one of the better approaches I've seen, where it's really just CSS um, that you're attaching to each one, because that's the main thing you actually care about when you're creating these components. Right. So I'm curious if. All this stuff you have to learn is overwhelming at all because you've listed off so far so many different buzzwords. Uh, you said React, Next.js, Apollo, Styled Components, you know, Prisma, GraphQL, blah blah blah. So there's like so many different so many different technologies in play here, uh, and there's a discussion in the broader community about whether web development has become too difficult to learn because of the amount of different software packages and libraries uh, that you have to understand in order to do a basic website. So I'm just curious what you think, since you it seems like you learned, well, I, actually, you said you learned programming when you were 12 or 13, so uh, may, maybe you did learn it in a, in a simpler way. But um, yeah, what are your thoughts on, on this? Is this overwhelming to you, or do you think making websites is, is too complicated? What do you think? I think yes. At first, when I when I saw the Out Zero uh, and Apollo GraphQL, I thought that I, I will never <laughs> integrate it uh, with with my app. Uh, I don't know how this works. I need to read a lot of uh, documentation. But uh, what helped me were the um, tutorials on the internet, uh, on the me medium medium blogs, and. Uh, a lot of uh, sample open source projects, they really helped me imp Im uh, implement that. But uh, uh, right when I, now when I'm creating an app, uh, I really focus on optimization. And uh, I see Google Chrome uses the new experimental feature uh, of lazy loading images. And uh, for me, uh, web development is getting a bit stressful and uh, you need to learn a lot. And that wasn't the case in the past. So when you initially learned, uh, did you just learn uh, like HTML, CSS, JavaScript? Uh, yes, exactly. Okay. So would you, if you, if your friend, if you had a friend or like a you know a little brother or sister who was trying to learn to program, would you tell them to start with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, or would you try to teach them some of the stuff that you're learning or that you're using right now, like 
you know, React and GraphQL and Apollo and stuff like that? Uh, in my opinion, uh, it's good to understand uh, the basics, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript first, because it makes uh, uh, learning other uh, libraries like React, uh, Next.js much, much easier uh, in the future. So I don't think starting uh, with, uh, with React is, is a good way. It's better to learn the basics. And uh, that's what I did. So with that in mind, a bit of a thought experiment. So you have your front end and your back end, and your major front end dependency is React. All these other things tie into React or are part of it. And on the back end, your major dependency, it seems like is Prisma. It's providing you that GraphQL layer, and you could swap out a database. So if I had to tell you, you're going to rewrite half of your application, and you're going to swap out one of your major dependencies. So you can't use React or you can't use Prisma. Which one would you be more willing to let go of? Or in other words, what's the harder thing that you have to rewrite or relearn a whole bunch of stuff if you didn't have? Would it be React or would it be Prisma on the back end? I think I would choose React. Making stuff in uh, vanilla JavaScript uh, isn't that hard. And uh, also, uh, I'm not really a backend developer, so removing Prisma would be uh, really, uh, really hard for me. I need to, lo- to learn a lot of new stuff. I'm more like a front-end developer, so, so yes, I would remove React. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, really, I think that React helps when you're dealing with you know, a website that has hundreds of components, and you have to, you know, you, you change the state in one place, and you want to have all the components be in sync with that state. Honestly, a website with like, you know, three, four, five pages is totally doable with plain vanilla JavaScript. I understand if, you know, once people get used to using React, why they would, you know, want to just use it all the time, even on a site that's simple. But uh, just because at that point, you're, you sort of have your, your tools on your tool belt, and you sort of know how everything, how everything works with React. And so you just want to use it always. But you don't really need it for in terms of it's not like it's impossible to make a plain uh, JavaScript website and to, to sort of keep the keep the state all in sync by hand for, for something that's that's simple enough. Yeah, I saw your uh, your uh, Beat Me Die uh, application and I think it's it's written in uh, pure JavaScript. Am I right? Bit MIDI? Uh, no, actually, it uses Preact. Preact. Oh, okay. Uh, but it's really impressive. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Preact is. I mean, it's the same API as React, pretty much. So. I would say for BitMidi, it was a little bit overkill in the sense that, you know, I, there's not that many different pages on the website. It doesn't really need, uh, it doesn't really need, you know, any kind of uh, framework. But that, but then again, the fact that Preact is so lightweight, it only adds three kilobytes to the bundle means that, you know, if I prefer that way of working, if I prefer, prefer a component model and, you know, the, the, the ease that mm-hmm. comes with that, then... I might as well just do it because I'm I'm not really paying any cost. So well, BitMidi is how do you do? Do you do server side rendering then, and how do you handle that? Yeah, BitMidi is has a lot of uh, unnecessary technical complexity. I would say <laughs> it does. Yeah, I was trying to go out of my way to do everything as perfect as possible, just sort of as a learning experiment for myself. So yes, it does server side rendering. It does it rehydrates on the client. You know, it has really good SEO actually. If you search for MIDI various MIDI searches, it's always number one. So it's pretty. It worked out in that sense, but yeah, it's complicated, and I'm still not happy with it. I feel like it's too complicated and it's too it's too brittle. Uh, I was impressed with the uh, WebAssembly uh, MIDI player on this on the, on your page. It's a nice uh, nice way to to use uh, to use WebAssembly, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the best strengths of, of WebAssembly is to be able to take existing libraries that you don't want to have to rewrite in JavaScript and just make them work. I, I actually considered rewriting rewriting it in JavaScript, but then I decided this is a perfect time to, time to learn WebAssembly. I'm actually diving into a bunch of WebAssembly stuff because it can represent a different security model. Um, so like you, you can't just like run arbitrary JavaScript from arbitrary people. Like that's a bad idea. Um, and there's a lot of limits to the current security model of the web and a lot of big holes in it, like privacy. But WebAssembly you know, doesn't have access to anything that you don't specifically pass into it. So if you can start to construct like ways to share WebAssembly code and to create like code around data structures in particular, it's a really interesting, like you, you can create a better security model where you actually can, you know, as long as you sort of contain the code and have certain limits on it, like you don't let it run for too long and stuff like that. Yeah, you can, you can now run kind of arbitrary code from arbitrary people. Also, uh, in terms of uh, PizzaQL, I'm thinking about re- rewriting it to TypeScript. 
because uh, only recently you learned about it uh, and uh, I think it's it's really cool it's a good way to, to write stuff and I'm already rewritten some of my modules to to TypeScript nice you can add one more buzzword to the list that's right <laughs> TypeScript. Buzzer bingo you are now compliant I, I I generally feel like this is actually kind of a hard time because it's not just that there's all of these tools to learn it's that we're also at this weird inflection point it feels like where the platform has caught up um, and a lot of our tooling that we rely on hasn't caught up with the changes in the platform, right? So there's a bunch of new stuff in the browser that we're not using and that some people are using, but then it's like this hard transition over to the new thing. For example? It, in the meantime, it's just like a lot of extra stuff to use. Like the entire module system, right? Like, um, like I, I have a relatively small package and I was, I was doing it at... A, a, the other day and start sort of figuring out where I'm using space. And in like just a regular tiny module project, there's like 200 megs of dependencies mm. in, it, in the full tree. And like most of that is not getting pulled in in the actual code. Um, like the, the bundle isn't 200 megs, but just yeah. like that's that's like the install size. Um, it, it's gotten crazy. Like I, I had no idea that it would blow up like this when we were, you know, starting this like nine years ago. But, uh, yeah, so like there's a new module system, there's new takes on module stuff like like Pika. Um, there's the entire async await transition that's like still happening. So there's a ton of infrastructure and projects that still use the old callback patterns. There's like and and honestly, I feel like TypeScript is also gonna end up being one of those things that we have an awkward transition away from because a bunch of people are gonna do a bunch of stuff in TypeScript. We're eventually going to add some kind of typing primitives to the language. The language will like, you know, update and the platform will update, and now we'll have all of this compile chain in the way. Um, and if you you look at like the pain that, that Node is going through in upgrading to these patterns, like I'm I'm just like not willing to take on a lot of new tooling that I think the platform is eventually gonna catch up on. So would you advise Anthony not to do what he's currently doing in terms of rewriting things in TypeScript, or what would, what would you advise him? I, I always I always caution people away from from TypeScript because it does look it it looks like one of those things that the, it, it's covering up a deficiency of the language. Right, Th that's the thing. Like that's the key. And Node, so much of Node that we wrote was covering up deficiencies of the language. And because we wanted to use them then, we needed to do that. But it's so painful now to to be sort of upgrading everything and to try and like break the world and break the entire platform in order to catch up. Right. Like streams is probably the biggest example. Like it's streams are, are super painful. Um, every new version of streams that we did ended up causing some break with the old stuff. There's now finally like an actual pattern in the language that fixes this and it's much, much better. And you realize very quickly that like the moment that you're handling errors in your own special way and, and not allowing them to throw, you are, you're off in your own crazy land and, and you do not have the platform to help you anymore. Mm -hmm. And you're definitely covering up a deficiency in the language. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you like using, um, async, uh, generators is, is like, just phenomenal like it's it's such a better pattern and, and everything that i built with it is like infinitely simpler to deal with um but um yeah it's just it, but it's awkward like you you can't use them still in most versions of node um well no, i guess that's not true anymore now that 12 is it's relatively uh current um so you actually have to even even lts now supports them although it does give you like an annoying warning about it but whatever you can deal um but it's been it's in all browsers now um but yeah, like, but but now, like, I have all these old stream code around, to right? Deal with. And like, okay, so do I wrap them in a thing that makes them an async generator, and then I have like a whole new class of weird edge cases and errors to deal with? Do I take the time to just rewrite that entire stream library? Yeah, throw that code out, man. Just throw it away. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's. I mean, that's what. This is one of the reasons why request is like effectively being deprecated, right? And we're like putting it into maintenance mode and, and trying to deprecate it because it's it's not going to be able to make this transition. Yeah. And newer, better libraries probably should take its place. Yeah. I don't know, Ferris. How do you feel about this? Because you you have as much <laughs> code out there in old patterns as I do that you have to maintain. It's so sad. All of our code is destined to be deleted. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Well, the best code is no code, so maybe that's a good thing. Although nothing seems to get deleted in the in the Node ecosystem, it just ends up in in your depths of depths, right? <laughs> so the crafty corner underneath the bed, or <laughs> yeah, I just I just got a I just merged a pull request on the on this package called Bitfield, which removes removes the Node buffer and switches over to uint 8 array, 
And that's like a 20 line package, but it took me like an hour to like review every line and make sure that all the edge cases worked correctly. So I don't want to imagine what it'd be like to remove buffer from something like WebTorrent, you know, it's plus it wouldn't even make sense at this point to do that because WebTorrent still uses streams and streams use buffers until there's actually a good story about how to do streams now in Node in the browser, which maybe there is. I don't know. Actually, we should do an episode about that maybe. But (laughs) once that exists, then I could see doing the work to refactor. But like, oh, it's going to be so much work. It's just I. Yeah, I don't know. I I attempted to not use buffers in new packages so that I don't um like take the buffer polyfill uh into those packages when they get packaged to the browser and I actually failed like I I just couldn't get like enough of the things working that I need to have working uh so I, I'd love to see packages that make like working <laughs> with uh with you know uh actual like browser friendly APIs a lot easier and, and so Anthony this would be my package. advice for you given where you are. T- TypeScript, take it or leave. I don't have a take on that. You can take Michael's advice or not. I think what I would do, if you were just like purely in this for the learning and the leveling up, I would get, I would imagine some version of what 1.0 looks like in terms of Pizza QL's functionality and get to there with your current stack. Like just, you know, pound it out, get to 1.0. And then mm-hmm. if you have the time and the inclination, I would throw out your front end. I would just throw the whole thing out and I would re- I would rewrite and leave the back end untouched, right? Completely untouched mm-hmm. and start completely fresh, brand new front end and write it with none of these these technologies. I bet you would learn a ton. I bet it would work mm-hmm. very well and I think you'd have fun doing that. I would have fun doing that actually. Okay, thanks. I will, I will, I think I will try that. Just some more unsolicited advice for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, like uh, one thing that I, I tend to tell newer programmers, and they're just people early in their career, is is to especially early on learn a lot of different learn languages that are really different from each other. So, like if you if you know Python, don't learn Ruby. Like that's a somewhat useless exercise. Um, but learning like very different languages can can really help you think about how to program, even in in the languages that you're most familiar with. Like. Um, like I never wrote a lot of Haskell, um, but learning Haskell was really, um, beneficial actually. It, it made me think about, uh, functional programming in a different way that, you know, just learning like what functional programming looks like in JavaScript never really made that kind of click. Right. Um, and like you're learning Rust. That's, that's a great one actually. Cause it's, it, it's a fully, t- it's a typed language. Um, and so you're, you're getting that experience and, and it also has like a very novel approach to, uh, memory management and ownership. That's, that's like actually very unique. Um, but it, it has you thinking about, um, the stack and the heap and the way that compilers work, um, in a way that I don't think that a lot of other languages actually kind of force you to think about. Um, so that's also like really cool. So yeah, yeah. Like I'm, I'm all for learning, um, lots of different languages that are very different from each other. That said, I don't feel like TypeScript is that different from anything that you're already learning. You have the typing in, in mm-hmm. Rust and, and the rest is basically just JavaScript. So. Yeah, for, for me, uh, learning Rust is, is, is harder than learning JavaScript, but that does not uh, throw me away from learning uh, Rust. And uh, for me, it's, it seems uh, really nice. Yeah, yeah. Also, a quick shout out to, to Rust compiler errors. I've never seen more humane errors in in, a, in any yeah, programming platform ever. Exactly. It's brilliant. Like, why doesn't everybody do this? <laughs> like, <laughs> the errors are not just like, oh, like you know, some arbitrary technical thing. It's like, oh no, here's like the human version of what this actually means <laughs> and probably how to fix it. It's really, really nice. And there's kind of been a renaissance in compiler or tooling error reporting with Rust. Elm uh, does a great job. Even Elixir, they're just very useful feedback from your compiler or your runtime, which is, uh, it's nice to see human interfaces for developers, you know, humane human interfaces for us developers who are used to like random like stack traces just pointing out to, you know, whatever it's well. So that's awesome. Well, any final thoughts? We're bumping up against our time uh, from y'all before we call this a show, Anthony or Faraz or Michael. I'm curious what uh, Anthony plans to do next. What's what are you most excited about? What's in your future? Uh, in pizza, in pizza cure or in my new projects? Uh, in your in your life. Uh, uh, oh, so I really want to continue making open source projects uh, and developing the existing ones. And in the future, I would also like to work uh, in a company that supports uh, open source uh, software. All right, that's our show this week. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see y'all next time. 
Thank you for tuning in to JS Party this week. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows. Head to changelaw.com slash community. And do us a favor. Share this show with a friend. We just have a podcast. Go into Overcast and favorite it. And thank you to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we move fast to fix things right here at ChangeLaw because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. We're hosted on Leno Cloud Servers. Head to Leno.com slash ChangeLaw. Check them out and support this show. Our music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at ChangeLaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Well, hello there, listeners. How are you? This is Adam Stachowiak. If you haven't heard yet, we're launching a new show called Brain Science. It's a podcast for the curious. Are you curious? Because if so, we're exploring the inner workings of the human brain to understand things like behavior change, habit formation, mental health, and what it means to be human. It's brain science applied. Not just how does the brain work, but how do we apply what we know about the brain? that can transform our lives. Learn more about the show and subscribe at changelog.com slash brain science. Until then, here's a preview of episode one, where we talk about the fundamentals of being human. We're also all designed to be in relationship. We are fundamentally hardwired to have social groups and and this sense of attachment. And because I'm sort of a, a geek when it comes to research, what researchers have found is that attachment, which that's what we label how we relate and connect with others. Attachment is 100% learned, which means our genetics don't actually contribute to how we learn to stay in proximity with other people. And with that, that we all develop ways to manage the threat of the loss of a relationship. But nobody gets to opt out of going, I need to be in relationship with others. I mean, think about it within the context of the prison system. Like, why is it that the punishment for prisoners when they don't fall in line is isolation? Mm, Yeah, that's true. Right? That wouldn't be significant if in some way that doesn't actually harm our brain. It's almost like we need to have that echo from another human being to let us know that we... Yeah. we're, We're there or we're alive or just some sort of feedback loop. I'm not really sure how to describe that. Well, it really is this sense of being with right? Like I can't fight battles on my friend's behalf or on my kid's behalf, right? But the simple fact that I know of what's going on makes a difference because yeah. I would contend it's sort of like I help them hold that weight emotionally. And so that actually leads me into the third thing. And the third thing that I would say in regards to the fundamentals of being human is that we all struggle. Oh, yes. <laughs> right? Big time. And that, you know, we don't always get to pick the way in which we struggle, but we all struggle. Well, if you like what you hear, you should go to changelog.com slash brain science. The show is not out yet, so don't get too excited. But you can subscribe and be notified as soon as the show launches. Once again, changelog.com slash brain science.